Hello, welcome to week eight of our U.S. history class. We are finally going to embark on World War One. If you haven't seen uh, the assignment page, I strongly recommend watching the crash course synopsis of the progressive presidents to get us from Roosevelt through Wilson or to Wilson really before watching this lecture on World War One because it will help give you a little bit more context for the domestic goings on in America. But our focus for this lecture will be World War One itself. And the lecture is kind of divided into three, if you only have a little bit of time today. There are three parts, three different opportunities for you to pause and take a break. So the first part um, I kind of talk about as the prelude to the war, the things that happen before the US is involved. So um, this is context of the war, more related to your European history class that you might remember from last year. Um, the second part is going to focus on the United States involvement in the war, both uh, actual combat in Europe as well as the changes that happen on the home front. And in the end of our lecture today, we'll focus on ending the war to end all wars. So we'll talk about the Treaty of Versailles and set up our live lessons for the week. So without any further ado, let's get started. The United States tries to stay neutral at the outbreak of World War I. So for the first uh, really three years of the war, the United States is not involved. We're sitting back and we're watching. Um, and so, but it's important to understand what is going on in Europe to understand why we do get involved and really why we don't get involved in the beginning. So if you remember from your previous history courses, World War I um, begins really in the Balkans with the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand. Right. In June of 1914, he and his wife are assassinated in Sarajevo by agents of the Black Hand. Um, and this kind of escalates things that are already super tense in Europe. In July, Austria, who had threatened war against Serbia, um, decides to invade. Right. This is obviously a lot more complicated. We're focused on the U.S. history section, so I'm just going to you know, move forward through this This how the war gets started. But essentially, Austria invades Serbia in retaliation for Serbian anarchists assassinating their Archduke because Austria, which is part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, really Austria is Austria-Hungary Empire, excuse me. Um, since they invade a Slavic state, the Slavic state of Serbia has an alliance with Russia, and so Russia declares war on Austria for invading Serbia. Because Austria and Germany have an alliance, Germany then declares war on Russia because Russia declared war on Austria. And Austria, of course, is the one that invaded Serbia. And because Germany has declared war on Russia, Germany also declares war on France because France is an ally of Russia. And because Germany wants to invade France very quickly. Instead of going through their fortified defenses, Germany goes right around through Belgium to get into France. And because Germany invades France, Britain declares war on Germany. So, recap. Within a week, pretty much all of the powers in Europe have declared war on each other. Austria starts with the invasion of Serbia. Russia then declares war on Austria, Germany declares war on pretty much everyone around them, and then Britain declares war on Germany. World War I has begun. Um, so I just put this on the bottom of the slide. Uh, it will be in April of 1917 that the United States actually enters the war on the side of uh, France and Great Britain and other allies, the Triple Entente. All right, so um, the war begins really in August of 1914, and it won't be until April of 1917 that the U.S. is involved. So let's take a look at a map of Europe. All right, you can see that uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy are known as the Central Powers. 
All right. And then the Triple Entente, the allies at the beginning of the war, are the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. Okay. And, you know, these other countries get involved as well, but the big ones are Russia, France, United Kingdom as the Triple Entente, the allies. Um, and then Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy in the beginning are the central powers. Now, Italy will actually switch sides before the end of the war, but uh, we don't really need to worry about that for right now. All right. As I stated previously, the U.S. declares neutrality at the beginning of the war. And the United States' biggest proponent of that neutrality is her president, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson writes in August of 1914, when the war is just beginning in um, Europe, he says, the effect of war upon the United States will depend upon what American citizens say and do. Every man who really loves America will act and speak in the true spirit of neutrality, which is the spirit of impartiality and fairness and friendliness to all concerned. The United States must be neutral in fact, as well as in name, during these days that are to try men's souls. Shout out to Thomas Paine. All right, so the U.S. declares its neutrality. They say, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. But of course, it doesn't really work out that way. First of all, U.S. trade by sea is confronted with naval blockades and submarine warfare. Most of our trade, obviously, if we go back to our map for a second, uh, because I'm recording this PowerPoint, it won't let me go back to our map, but use your mind to visualize we don't have a lot of sea trade with Germany because it's largely landlocked. So most of our trade is going to be with France and England. So while we may be neutral and continuing our normal affairs, definitely commerce benefits the Triple Entente much more so than Germany. And so um, U.S. ships are being attacked by German submarines. Germans um, are big proponents of submarine warfare. Now, most of the time, it is not a big deal on like a, in a media blitz kind of way in the United States. But when the British passenger liner, liner the Lusitania, is sunk by a German submarine, people really see this as an escalation in the type of warfare that is going on. Because to the average citizen, they say, why would a German military vessel, a submarine, attack a passenger liner? This is, think like Titanic. You have these big passenger ships steaming across the Atlantic, and the Lusitania is one of them that is actually attacked by a German submarine. And among the lives lost are 128 Americans. Now, on a, as a sidebar... The U.S. Secretary of State, Williams Jenny Bryant, warned Americans they shouldn't be traveling on steamers like this to Europe because it wasn't safe. But no one listened to him, including even the president who refused to actually ban travel, and he ends up resigning. But anyway, back to the Lusitania. Wilson has to react, right? So he sends a warning to Germany that they will be held strictly accountable for acts like this. Now, the German reply unofficially is the Lusitania was carrying weapons from America back to England, so why wouldn't they sink it? Um, about a year later, the Sussex, which is another unarmed mer merchant ship, is also attacked by a German sub, and then Wilson threatens to cut off all diplomatic relations with Germany. All right, so this is in 1915 and 1916. The result is not much. Germany makes the Sussex pledge, right? Hand over their heart and they say, uh, we promise not to sink merchant or passenger ships without warning. Essentially, a submarine will pop up. They'll send a nice message that says, you know, dear ship, passenger ship, merchant ship, we believe you are carrying contraband or other things to our enemy. We're going to torpedo your vessel. You have five minutes to man your lifeboats and get out of the way before we sink your ship. 
And so that is seen as the more civilized way to do warfare. The ship is still lost, but the lives are preserved. So anyway, that's the Sussex Pledge. That's the way this submarine warfare should be con conducted uh, by civilized people around the world. So anyway, that's 1915, 1916. 1916 is an election year, right? And so the, uh, Wilson has to decide kind of what his platform is going to be. And in 1916, he has to consider all of kind of the people who are voting. And there are very, very strong ethnic influences in the country. So I have these five bullet points about kind of different immigrants. So we just look at the country's population, Americans, people that are American. In 1914, 30% of the United States population is either a first or second generation immigrant. All right, so almost a third of people have relatives that they know either that are with them that were born in another country or they have rel further distant relatives that are still in Europe. And so, you know, most Americans are happy to support neutrality because they have great sympathy for their homeland and it's not quite, you know, not quite as straightforward as you would think. German immigrants, obviously, they're going to have a lot of sympathy for Germany. They're going to be pro-German in their support with who's in the right and who's in the wrong with World War I. Um, Irish immigrants is a little bit tricky. Um, a lot of Irish immigrants. And what many people find surprising is that the Irish actually lean towards supporting the central powers because the Irish have this very, very uh, contentious relationship with the British. Great Britain controls Ireland. Um, and it'll actually be during World War I that a lot of these big Easter uprisings and things in Ireland take place. Um, so Irish immigrants, because of their hatred for Britain, often side with the central powers. Italian immigrants, originally part of the central powers, um, when Italy changes sides of the war in after 1915, Italian immigrants also kind of uh, shift their support, whether central power or Entente. Um, but outside of those big immigrant groups, German, Irish, Italian immigrants, most other Eastern European immigrants are sympathizing with uh, the Triple Entente, their, uh, their Slav Slavic brethren in Eastern Europe that are being uh, controlled and oppressed by uh, the imperial powers of Austria-Hungary to, um, to a less, slightly lesser extent, Germany. Um, a lot of the immigrants that fled Germany did so because they were oppressed. Um, and then outside of those ethnic groups, we obviously as a country have the closest ties with France and Great Britain. And so what I'm saying is the country is really, really split. And Wilson feels like it's the best way to be elected to keep his neutrality stance. And so he runs on the, the slogan, he kept us out of war. All right. So the election of 1916, November of 1916, Wilson's going around. Everyone's like, vote for Wilson. He kept us out of war. Vote for Wilson. He kept us out of war. And Wilson wins the election. All right. In January of 1917, Germany decides to resume unrestricted warfare. No more Sussex Pledge, no more warnings. U-boats, submarines just start shooting anything that they can. All right. So that greatly upsets American uh, diplomatic relations. It upsets the general populace. Um, on March 1st, the Zimmerman telegram is intercepted. And this really riles up public opinion because this telegram is leaked to the press. And it's called the Zimmerman Telegram because the ambassador of Germany sends a note to Mex the Mexican president that essentially says, hey, if you invade the United States, if you side with Germany and attack the United States, we'll help you get back all of that land that you lost in the Mexican-American War. 
So we're talking California, New Mexico, Arizona, they'll all be in Mexico if only Mexico will side with Germany. So this leaks and you know the public outcry is immense. Like how dare Germany try to instigate an invasion of the United States? What are we going to do? This is pretty much a declaration of war. And then two weeks later on the Ides of March 1917, Russian revolutionaries remove the czar. Right? And this is kind of the final piece that allows the United States to engage in the war. So Wilson believes that it is his moral duty under his moral diplomacy kind of viewpoint to make the world safe for democracy. Now, if you're fighting alongside a people that are ruled by a czar, a Caesar, you can hardly be the champion of democracy because the Russian czars have been oppressive leaders for centuries. Right? But now that revolutionaries have removed the czar and Russia negotiates its own peace with Germany, suddenly that's not an aspect. And the United States in April will actually enter the war. All right, this is kind of part two. The United States engages in World War I. Um, this is from Wilson's address to Congress on April 2nd, 1917. We are glad to fight thus for the ultimate peace of the world and for the liberation of its peoples. The world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. And so once again, the United States fighting on the side of democracy will join Great Britain and France to fight the central powers of Austria, Hungary, and Germany. So as we, let me pause to take a quick sip of water and talk about the US troops abroad and their effects on the home front. So when it comes to what's happening in the United States, remember the United States has been in a state of neutrality. They haven't been arming for war. This is gonna be very, very different than um, World War II. When you study World War II next year, or perhaps if you're lucky enough, the end of this year, um, you know, the US is preparing for World War II long before we're in World War II. But that is not the case in World War I. We were really unprepared for war. So we go from this economy and society of neutrality to transition into this war period. And one of the ways the United States does that is Wilson signs the Selective Service Act, the draft, right? And 2.8 million Americans are going to be drafted into service. So that's over half of the 4.7 million Americans that serve in the war, 2.8 million of them are drafted into that service. All right, but the draft, the idea that you can force someone to fight in a war is incredibly controversial. And people start speaking out against the war, they speak out against the draft, and the, United, uh, the Congress of the United States passes the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Right. The Espionage Act, and we usually talk about the Espionage and Sedition Acts together. The Espionage Act, passed in 1917, says that you can be imprisoned for up to 20 years if you incite rebellion in the armed forces or obstruct the operation of the draft. So this is specifically geared at uh, people they feel are against the draft, and they see this as... Uh, German sympathizers and anarchists are leading this, um, even communists to a certain extent, are leading this effort against the draft. So this uh, law is targeting those people. The Sedition Act passed a year later in 1918 prohibits anyone from making, quote, disloyal or abusive remarks about the government. Right. So immediately, I know you are thinking, this doesn't sound very American. This seems like it flies directly in the face of the First Amendment, your freedom of speech, your freedom of the press, your freedom to petition, right? 
Well, under the Espionage and Sedition Act, 2,000 people are prosecuted, 1,000 people are convicted and jailed, including the socialist leader Eugene Debs, who had a brief run for president in 1912. Um, and a lot of people agree with you that it seems like these laws, the Espionage and Sedition Act, seem contrary to the constitutional foundations of freedom that we hold so dearly in this country. And it makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court in the um, Supreme Court case, Shank versus the United States. Right? Shank versus the United States challenges the legality of prior restraint, of jailing someone not because of their actions really, but because of their words. Right? And in a landmark decision, the Supreme Court rules that the government did not violate the First Amendment of the Constitution. Right? Um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes writes, I believe, the majority opinion, and he says that the United States has the right to restrict speech that is, a, sorry, I'm writing with my touchpad and mouse, which is atrocious, a clear and present danger. All right, so while I work through that, let me, um, the, what is famous in this opinion is that uh, Holmes writes that well, there are always limits on free speech. For instance, you cannot shout fire in a crowded theater, right? Because by shouting fire in a crowded theater, you would cause a panic, you would cause a stampede, and people would be put at risk because of your speech. And he says that um, speech against the draft that would incite riot or incite people to uh, directly disregard a, a law of the United States poses a clear and present danger in times of war. And so um, Shank versus the United States is a landmark Supreme Court decision when it comes to limiting freedom of speech. Now, of course, there will be many other cases in the 20th century where kind of the the vagueness and the broadness of a clear and present danger is more narrowly defined. but Early in our 20th century history, I believe this is a ruling that's passed in 1919, clear and present danger is going to be the new standard for what can limit free speech. Other places on the home front, let's talk a little bit about um, African Americans, women, and Mexican immigration. Now, first of all, Woodrow Wilson um, has passed executive orders and signed laws that uh, continue segregation. Wilson is actually quite the segregationist. Um, and so he does not promote civil rights really in any way. And he makes sure that the army is segregated just like the rest of the federal government. Um, for those of you who are you know, hoping that the United States is going to be a little bit more progressive during this progressive era in race relations, you are going to be sorely disappointed. The United States will not integrate its armed services fully until after World War II. I believe uh, Truman passes the Integration Act in like 1948. So in, in World War I, the entire army is segregated. All right. Um, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois believes, much like Frederick Douglass did a couple generations before, that African Americans fighting and dying for their country is the surest way to win equal rights. And so 400,000 African Americans do serve in segregated units um, in all divisions of the United States uh, services except the Marine Corps where no African Americans, no minorities are allowed to serve. Right? Um, but kind of Du Bois' belief that fighting will make a difference in civil rights really doesn't happen. Um, but what does happen is because of um, the, the 
shift in the economy to a wartime economy and employment opportunities, there are a lot of African Americans that move to the north, um, specifically to areas like New York and Harlem, that will lead to things like the Harlem Renaissance and kind of the next era of uh, United States history. So 400,000 African Americans serve in World War I. Um, many African Americans uh, move north during this time period to get uh, more plentiful jobs but it really doesn't change the status of African Americans and their fight for civil rights in the first uh, really half of the 20th century. Um, women, on the other hand, also working to break out of that cult of domesticity are um, also given opportunities to work in the workplace, outside of the home, because so many soldiers have been drafted by the Selective Service Act. Remember, 2.8 million Americans drafted into the Army. That's 2.8 million jobs that need to be filled. And that's why African Americans are moving north to fill those jobs. It's also why women have an easier time getting into the workplace. Right? Um, World War I is also a tremendous uh, boom of Mexican migration to the United States. Uh, thousands come to work in agriculture and mining, especially in the West and the Southwest. Um, and so there's going to be this other immigrant population that is coming into the United States. Um, I don't have a reading on Mexican immigration uh, for this week, but I do have a reading on um, kind of immigration in general and prejudice in the United States. It's called The House on Lemon Street and actually focuses on Japanese immigrants. Um, and it talks about the racism and the segregation and the legal obstacles that they face in California in 1916. Um, so I encourage you to take the time to read that if you can. Let's move on to the war itself. So in April of 1917, there is 900,000 tons of shipping in that one month lost all right, due to submarine warfare and different things. So the first thing the United States does is they implement a convoy system, not to be confused with your wonderful US history teacher, but rather a convoy with a V system, a convoy system, meaning that there's like a caravan of ships and all the ships are gonna sail across the Atlantic escorted by US naval vessels. So if any submarines do show, there are military ships there to get the sub before the sub gets you kind of attitude. Right? And it's very effective and it does kind of uh, hurt the submarine warfare and it enables the supplies that the US is um, sending to a desperate France and England to get across the Atlantic safely. Now the lead force of Americans in World War I is called the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, and its commander is John J. Blackjack Pershing. Right? And he is going to assume an independent role on the Western Front. And what I mean about that is the United States isn't going to send their troops to the war and allow them to be commanded by some British general or some French general. No, they're an independent force and they'll do what they want to do when they get there. And really what they do is from September through November or till November of 19, um, sorry, 1917, they're going to take part in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Right. This is the really big offensive um, that the Americans engage in to push Germany back over the German border. Once again, you can picture your, the map in your mind when Russia uh, signs its truce with Germany. Germany can shift all of its efforts to the Western Front. It has no Eastern Front to worry about with Russia, so everything is shifted to the Western Front where France is, and so Germany quickly pushes even further into France. And so that is where this war is going to be raged, waged. Rather. Um, another reading opportunity that I have for you this week is to read uh, a little excerpt about trench warfare from All Quiet on the Western Front. I know some of you probably read excerpts of that last year as well, but it's kind of the, the 
literature, pinnacle literature, classic literature example of World War I. So there, I do have a little excerpt from that for you to read if you have an opportunity this week. Anyway, the Muse Argonne effect, Offensive involves more than half a million American and French troops, and they are very successful in pushing Germany back to the German border. The Meuse Argonne Offensive ends on November 11th with the armistice with Germany. It ends World War I. November 11th, if you know your calendar, is Veterans Day, which used to be known as Armistice Day, because that is the day that peace or the ceasefire truce was negotiated with Germany. So this 47-day offensive in 1918 essentially ends the war. I mean, it doesn't essentially end the war. It does end the war by uh, forcing Germany to realize that they're going to lose. Um, the U.S. has tremendous fatalities. Um, 112,000 Americans die in World War I. 49,000 are combat deaths. The other, um, math is difficult for me late at night, <laughs> the other 62,000 or so, 63,000 that are dead um, are from not combat, but rather from disease. All right. um, but the while the U.S. losses seem staggering, um, they're nothing compared to the rest of Europe. This table gives us a sense of uh, the death and casualty numbers of the other countries involved. Remember, the United States joins in 1917. Moves are going offensive in 1918, cost most of the deaths for the United States. Um, we only lose uh, about 7% of the people fighting in the war. If you look at these other numbers, they are staggering. Russia, the casualties as a percent of a total force, and remember casualty is both killed and wounded, right? Killed and wounded. Um, but 76% of Russian soldiers are either killed or wounded in World War I. British, we have 35%. France, 73%. Three quarters of the French population or of the French soldiers suffer or die in World War One. You have nearly 40% in Italy. Um, staggering numbers in all these allies. If you look at this, so you have 52% of the soldiers that fight in World War Two are either killed or wounded. And the other side is equally staggering, right? You have 90% of the soldiers in Austria-Hungary's empire dead or wounded at the end of the war, 60, nearly 65% in Germany. Um, Turkey, Bulgaria also have pretty good numbers, but or pretty high numbers. But you have 67% of the central power um, going to going to be dead or wounded at the end of the war. So the cost of this in Europe is just unbelievably immense. And with those cost numbers and human lives in your head, we move on to the third part of the lecture today, which is ending the war to end all wars with the Treaty of Versailles. So the role of the United States isn't really so much in, uh, you know, specific soldiers for the duration of the war, but rather it's the, the potential of what the United States brings, right? Their contribution is through food, through arms, through money, through oil, and lastly, manpower. And as your textbook says, right, the Yanks fought only two major battles at St. Mihail and in the Meuse Argonne, both in the last two months of a four-year war. It was the prospect of endless U.S. troops reserves from America, rather than its actual military performance, that eventually convinced the Germans to surrender. Right. So it wasn't really what they 
immediately contributed, it was that we had nearly 5 million soldiers waiting to join the war. That was the United States' big role. So when it comes to the Treaty of Versailles, everyone looks at the cost in human lives, right? We have 22 million total casualties on the Allied side, 15 million total casualties on the Central Power side. So you have 50% of everyone who fought. Um, and so people go into the Treaty of Versailles feeling pretty fired up, right? The U.S. has the goal of peace without victory. This is Wilson's motto. We want to establish a peace without victory. So what he means is kind of in uh, sportsmanship language, we want to be good winners, right? We want to have peace throughout the world, but we don't want to burden a specific person or in this case, a country as the loser and the one who's to blame, right? So he wants to establish peace without victory. But it's easy for the U.S. to say the U.S. only lost 7% uh, only 7% of its soldiers involved in World War I are dead or wounded. Most are still waiting in ships to be you know, transported over to the war. On the other hand, Italy, France, Germany, sorry, not Germany at all, Italy, France, or Great Britain have suffered these staggering losses and their people and their leaders are demanding kind of retribution. Right. So the big four structure the Treaty of Versailles. Um, Georges Clemenceau, if you listen to the stereotypical accent in the name, he is from France. David Lloyd George will be from Britain. Uh, Vittorio Orlando will be the uh, Italian leader. And of course, the fourth of the big fours, Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Right. And so in the end, Wilson's goals are largely ignored. Here are the peace terms. Number one, Germany will disarm. It is stripped of all its colony, colonies and it must admit guilt for the war and pay reparations. So this peace without victory, out the window with point number one. It's Germany's fault. Germany must admit that it's their fault. They must agree to pay war debt to all of these other countries. Number two, the principle of self-determination for Eastern Europe will be embraced. So pretty much the Austria-Hungarian empire is destroyed. We're gonna have all of these new countries, uh, some of which still exist today, others like Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, which are created, um, which are gonna be filled and rife with tensions and um, their own ethnic difficulties, will, which will result in peaceful and uh, other conf uh, armed conflicts in the future. All right. um, and the third point is really the big point that Wilson pushed for and really, really wanted. He wants an international peacekeeping organization. And this peacekeeping organization will be known as the League of Nations. League of Nations that is supposed to prevent all future world wars from happening. Since we call this World War I, we know that it was not successful. Um, but this is my opportunity to promote our um, anal one of our analyzed activities this week is to read Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. He goes to the Treaty of Versailles with 14 points, 14 ideas of how we can achieve peace without victory, how we can achieve uh, a lasting world peace for generations to come. Um, but I don't really want to talk about too many of them here. Um, in fact, I'm not going to talk about any of them here other than this is his plan and you should read about them and answer a couple of the reflection questions as part of our analyze assignment this week. We are going to do activities related to the Treaty of Versailles at the end of the week, but essentially Wilson, who is the face of this scroll here, comes back to the United States with the Treaty of Versailles. Now, if you remember back to the beginning of the year when we were talking about checks and balances, um, any treaty of the United States must be ratified by the Senate. So just because Wilson has agreed to the treaty doesn't mean the United States has. And so 
the treaty is not welcomed by the Republican Congress. And the battle and the election of 1920 will actually turn into a referendum about the treaty and about the, the future of the League of Nations. And that's what we'll talk about um, on Friday in class this week. Kind of the fate of the treaty, the internationalist the reservations, the, the irreconcilables, and we'll talk about all of these famous people. But I have gone on and on. I apologize. I broke 40 minutes with our lecture this week, which was not my intent, but it was a lot to cover. Hopefully you made it through with me. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in class.